Um, we're going to start the afternoon session with a presentation from Narendra Ahuja uh, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he'll be speaking about his project uh, titled Adding Audiovisual Cues to Signs and Symptoms for, triggering, for Triaging Suspected or Diagnosed COVID-19 Patients. We are working on triaging of uh, patients for efficient use of the hospital facilities. And our work is based mainly on using audiovisual cues to uh, help with the triaging process. <clears throat> so the team, our team is, uh, consists of uh, three universities. Um, I'm the PI and uh, Professor David Weiser from University of Chicago. Uh, Professor David Chestek and Jerry Krishnan from University of Illinois at Chicago, and Professor Mark Hasigawa Johnson, my colleague at UIUC. And I see them uh, in the audience. So if there are any questions, we can, uh, we can uh, go to them. Uh, first of all, this doesn't need to be restated. The situation is, is bad. And the hospitals have been having difficulty keeping up with the patient load. And I've been thinking about how to handle the, the load with the limited resources, with the emergency departments. The early, one of the early things that was discovered in this process a thinking process of how to handle this. One thing that became clear was that a lot of the patients were uh, uh, apparently okay, but there was still a chance of them uh, relapsing. And so it was not clear whether to discharge them or not to discharge them. Uh, if you discharge them, it's good because they will recover better at home. But then what happens if they decompensate? Uh, so the problem was solved by letting them overstay at the hospital, which means more beds, which means fewer beds for the new patients. So in the context of this, uh, the attention to telemedicine became uh, uh, more uh, prevalent. People were beginning to think more and more about how to use, how to bring telemedicine into the fore. It's not been as, as useful. It had not been as useful as one would have liked because of the need being not as severe. But now with the smartphone being a you know, great enabler without the Wi-Fi, without the computer necessary. So the telemedicine became a, a favorite solution. Uh, and because it was uh, uh, not going to require the, the, a lot of equipment, if, if at all you could do that. Uh, the, uh, need because of the infancy of the of these telemedicine uh, solutions that were available, the uh, there was a need to bring in AI, uh, basically to tell whether the uh, at home when a patient is at home whether the patient is sick or not sick. And if there is a reason to believe that things may get worse, then to escalate the situation, you know, calling 911 or, or sending them to ER without doing that. But that capability has to be there in order for telemedicine to be uh, workable. So that is the context in which our uh, project was conceived. Um, our goal is to have AI algorithm that can estimate the health parameters, just like a, a, a staff in hospital would do. You estimate the various vitals, for example. Uh, diagnose, and as I just said, because, uh, because prediction is critical, if the person is at home, then uh, prediction capability is very important. And of course, these are all the tasks that uh, are the objectives of AI 
if the person is to successfully stay at home and still not suffer the consequences of being not at the hospital. <clears throat> now, once you do that, you don't have the doctor next to you. You don't have all the other experts next to you. Uh, so you want the system, the AI algorithm system to be accurate, to be consistent, to be non-intrusive as Nigel's talk uh, emphasized this morning, should, should be fast, should be scalable, and most of all, easy to use by ordinary people. And of course, inexpensive by the same token, which means it should be implementable on commodity hardware to minimize the cost. And finally, remote co contact with the system should be easy. It should be, the whole thing should be communication friendly. Now, initially, it, it, it's okay if it only assists physicians and the mid-level providers. And later on, we can, once trust is built, once the system has been uh, known to perform well, has been seen to perform well, then trust will come automatically and hopefully autonomy will follow. So uh, this is the context and our approach to doing this is to use uh, a whole bunch of different sensors, uh, each being capable of doing a good job in on different aspect of the patient's health. Uh, all those things that we listed earlier, we would want uh, this multi-sensor system to bring the strengths of different uh, sensors to overcome their weaknesses so that the overall system does as desired. So our targeted system is one that would monitor, predict, communicate, all of this using commodity tools to, to address the various aspects of cost and usability, et cetera. And what we have done in our uh, last several months of work, uh, probably around, starting around October, uh, what we have done is divided, up, divided the, our, our project into two parts. The first part is only vitals estimation, uh, meeting those requirements that I just listed. And second, is on diagnosis and prediction. With that stage, we are expecting to follow. Uh, for now, our focus is on, on vitals estimation and stage two will follow after that, depend, once we are done with stage one, whenever that is hopefully by summer. Uh, for validation, you know, the algorithms that we develop uh, for validating them, we will have uh, vital signs monitors that are in emergency departments currently being used as the ground truth as doctors uh, the, um, way to find out. And second, uh, there will be physicians to review it also, of course. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah. Uh, and then the deployment for testing purposes would be at the same places where the data are being collected, namely University of Illinois at Chicago Hospital and University of um, Illinois at uh, University of Chicago Hospital. Those are the two places where the data are coming from, as well as the validation and deployment will happen. The specific signs that we are um, aiming for are um, heart rate, respiration rate, uh, pulse oximeter, temperature, hydration level, and hemoglobin level. And also we are including in our purview uh, the physical and neuro exam, uh, parts of physical and neuro exam that is typically given to a patient. So uh, this is the system we are targeting. Our goal is to be able to do these things in a, uh, in a, in a way that we, I, we, just, we just listed, namely the system should have all those characteristics that will make it useful and practical. 
So let me just quickly uh, give you uh, in a couple of minutes where things stand today, not in our work, but overall in the field. Uh, and, and I mean audiovisual estimation because that's our, uh, our focus. And really that is also has been the focus of almost all work so far. Uh, a lot of work has been done on visual method based methods, some on audio based methods. Uh, and so here is a, just a quick review of where things stand. So the four areas that we have reviewed before we start making our own contributions are heart rate estimation, uh, respiration rate estimation, blood pressure, and blood oxygen. The methods that have been around, that are around, the, the literature is not very large, uh, maybe dozens of papers uh, on uh, spectral-based, color-based analysis of the patient skin, for example, uh, movement, uh, how things move, whether it's because of blood or because of um, respiration, whatever the cause, but motion is a cue uh, for heart rate, similarly for respiration rate, chest motion, muscle motion, color changes, temperature changes. For blood pressure, color changes in skin when the blood flows, wherever the blood pulse or, or burst is, that's where the skin changes color. Uh, how much oxygen is in the blood that also can is revealed in spectral characteristics. And for example, movement of eyes through uh, the level of presence of oxygen pill, you know, it uh, affects the movement of sclera. So uh, these are the, the, the kinds of things that have been done in the visual cues area. Uh, in, there are, and, and of course we want to do, we, we also want to uh, include audio features. We have done a, a, a survey on audio features. They have been used also in many of these things. So, so the, the goal that we have set for ourselves is that uh, we want to uh, use all of these things combined in a manner that we take the strengths of all and weaknesses to overcome the weaknesses of all. So, uh, and this is in contrast with what has happened so far, which is uh, people have done X from Y, you know, one particular vital or sometimes two vitals from a single modality. And so we hope that by doing all of this, we'll come up with a system that is, that is a, a practical because it has all those properties that I mentioned. Now, let me just give you some uh, recent results. We have not obtained uh, uh, publishable results yet or publish it, publication level results so far from the work here. Uh, and I'll tell you the details in a minute. But what we have uh, done is we have looked at what of our past work, which aspects, which uh, projects in our past work can give us a head start, namely uh, uh, which results that we have can be immediately used to, to at least partly enable the objectives that we have set for ourselves. So I'll go over the image and video and audio and machine learning and audio visual integration, all are examples of these to uh, give you a sense of uh, what the problems involved are and what uh, we have done that could be, uh, can, can be used as a starting point. So here is a, 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 an example of given an image, not a video, just an image and also video. So this one is an image example where you can get hierarchical uh, syntactic structure in it so that then you can use it for, for example, learning. Whether the image is uh, you know, complicated or complicated in structure and complicated in illumination, for example, the shadow here. Um, estimation of 3D post sequence. That is very important for exams. So here, for example, we have 
uh, a doctor uh, showing a doctor uh, uh, showing the uh, uh, gait that happens with Parkinson's, characteristic of Parkinson's. Um, it is, you're given video frames, you're given, uh, which are obviously 2D, and you want to generate uh, 3D human post sequence because then you can arc, uh, reason about whether things are going okay or not. So you can generate all these uh, and joint positions, et cetera. And from input, you can get uh, uh, an output 3D pose shown here. Uh, the input is this video and the output is shown uh, through visualization uh, in this right cube. Uh, and hopefully since we know these parameters here uh, on the right, you can then uh, relate it to the clinician's knowledge and see whether, or model it or predict what is happening or classify whether this is serious or not. Here's an example of voice conversion where you can take a, a voice, input voice, and you can break it up into pieces and control them, the pieces being timber, pitch, rhythm, et cetera. So you can uh, 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 get access to them individually, which is to say that we can uh, then sim in a similar way, analyze uh, sounds for, for health analysis. Here we are talking about scream detection, uh, given an audio signal, can you detect screams? So again, those things could be translated to cough and other uh, respiration, the uh, aspects of health. Uh, here is an example of audio visual synthesis where we have input frames coming in, input audio coming in and sync. And suddenly the video stops, but the audio continues. Can you use that audio to create the video frames knowing how they are related from before? So in other words, can you produce these following three frames that are shown below? without seeing them because they were occluded or something. So again, the, 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 uh, the uh, relationship to what our project wants to do is obvious. Finally, on the machine learning side, our focus of the work that we are doing, uh, and a lot of this should be available to report uh, by summer. Uh, uh, we are working on an architecture that is, uh, um, interpretable, this is learning architecture, which is tractable, which means analytic, uh, compact, which means it can be embedded uh, in, in, edge, in edge hardware, for example. And all of this is done in a tractable, optimal manner so that we can change it, uh, extend it, analyze it uh, as needed. Uh, coming to patient data collection, uh, we have a total of 250 patients targeted uh, at the two hospitals, UIC and UC hospitals, emergency departments. Uh, and they are mostly COVID, but we are not ruling other uh, diseases out, pulmonary diseases, sorry, that should be PUL. Uh, uh, we have data collection script that we have debugged collectively. We have come up with a method of exactly what we'll do it's about 30, 35 minute long data collection script. And the IRB approvals are expected anytime now, uh, hopefully within the next 10 days. And so that we can then actually start the data collection. In the meantime, we are doing things informally with uh, you know, uh, of collecting our own data and seeing it for ourselves. So there are no IRB problems. And finally, what we expect in the next six months is uh, a system that would have uh, as much of what I mentioned earlier in our uh, um, plans. Uh, we will have that system. We would uh, uh, be testing them on the patient data that we are collecting, that we are going to be collecting soon, um, by the end of the month, hopefully. And then uh, we would have validated it using the ground truth that is available at the time of data collection. And finally, in the light of our experience here, we hope that we'll have a nice framework for taking this forward to stage two, which is of course diagnosis and, and, and prediction. So that brings me to the uh, 
to the end of the overview. Great. Thank you very much, Arinda. Um, we maybe have a time for one question if there's something. I don't see any in the chat. I have a quick question. Um, sure. So uh, you talked about vital signs monitoring. I think these days Apple Watch has a lot of these features. I was just curious if the audio visual uh, uh, measurement uh, would be more accurate or could complement something like that. Um, or I guess it, it has more capabilities than- Yes, and yeah, more capabilities there are because there is much more information in, uh, in, in vision and sound. And, and these have been proven individually. Uh, for example, we developed an app that is now being used in a number of hospitals. All it does is uses cough. And it's so effective that it has gone through clinical trials and it's now widely being used in hospitals because, it, but it's only for cough to detect wet or dry cough. Now that's an important problem, but that's one problem. The question is, can we use the visual and audio features, which is of course what doctors do, uh, which is not to say that doctors do only those, you know, they use knowledge. So can we synthesize the, the vast knowledge that the doctors have and the video and audio uh, cues? Hopefully they will be more than what your watch can hear than when it is listening to your wrist. Okay, thank you. One other comment related to that. This is uh, Dave Chestick, one of the co eyes at um, UIC. I'm an emergency medicine doctor. One of the things that we're finding with COVID as well is that um, respiratory rate is a big predictor. And that's something that you can't get from a wristwatch, both at rest and also like walking. So if we just have a patient walk in place for a minute, which is actually part of our, um, our uh, protocol here, and then if the respiratory rate shoots up, they're very deconditioned. That's a huge predictor of hospital admissions. So that's uh, one more thing that a wristwatch wouldn't be able to get. Thank you. 